It's um, Commander Ron Sonier. It's S A U N I E R. So, commander of the Major Crimes Division. Wanted to brief you about the incident uh, occurred yesterday afternoon, about 1240-ish or so in the afternoon. Uh, just want to remind everybody that this is a still a very active and ongoing investigation. Uh, we're still working it very hard, so get you some preliminary information that's out here. Uh, as it goes on, some stuff may be subject to change based on what we go, but I wanted to kind of get out and get you some information going to start kind of on the timeline of the events that occurred as on uh, March 17 2016 at approximately 11:20 a.m. officers responded to a bank robbery at 530 South Holly Street uh, once they got there they were able to determine that this was a takeover style bank robbery uh, which is, is a generally a very violent type uh, robbery. Uh, the suspect in this case was armed with a handgun. He fell and he menaced all of the victims that were in the bank at the time and eventually was ordering those victims to be proned out on the ground face down. Uh, when we start seeing in my past history with a lot of these bank robberies when robberies start progressing to the point that they're putting people down on the ground and face down you're escalating the level of violence and the propensity for violence. Uh, we did get out a special bulletin with pictures, a Crime Stoppers bulletin that was placed out I, shortly after the crime that was distributed. I believe that the PIOs have if you need copies of it and don't have it uh, there. So the Safe Streets Task Force that works with the FBI and Denver. We have Denver officers assigned to that task force began the bank robbery investigation into this and were very actively working on this investigation. Uh, shortly before April 11th, they started developing some information uh, that led them to obtain an arrest warrant for a party uh, for the aggravated bank robbery being armed. So the warrant was signed on April 11th. It was immediately turned over to the FBI's Safe Streets Fugitive Apprehension Group, uh, another leg of that same task force. They began running and developing information on the location of the suspect. Uh, in the early morning hours of April 11th, or April 12th, they were able to locate a vehicle associated with our party and began surveillance on that vehicle. Uh, a plan was put in place to utilize our Metro officers on any takedown on this particular deal. The, uh, while everything was kind of in progress on this, the suspect came out to the vehicle with another female and a child, got into the vehicle, and this vehicle wound up going mobile. Uh, the surveillance detectives began following this vehicle, ultimately uh, following it down to the point that it parked over here in the 1300 block of North Bannock Street and uh, began watching that vehicle getting resources into place to uh, affect the arrest of our suspect. The uh, detectives in this particular case watched the vehicle and watched the female occupant and the small child exit the vehicle and they began walking away from the vehicle at one point they began walking back towards the vehicle that was aired across the air and then they walked back away from the vehicle once they felt that it was clear that the only occupant that was in the vehicle was there uh, the decision to move up and try to affect the rest was made so officers pulled in to the car in an effort to try to box it into the position the vehicle did back up just real briefly they readjusted their cars and pretty much limited how much that vehicle could move forward. Uh, based on information that we have from witnesses and other evidence that we have at the scene, the officers from the Metro SWAT unit uh, spent approximately one minute or just under one minute time giving verbal orders to the suspect at the vehicle. Uh, there was some indication that there was some acknowledgement and there was non-compliance uh, by the party that was going on. Uh, for those that were at the scene yesterday, the vehicle that is in question or the suspect vehicle in this particular case 
does have some heavily tinted windows on both the passenger and driver side windows uh, so it's very hard to see into the vehicle from the side. The officer uh, that was at the front, uh, like I said, everybody was giving orders for this guy to comply. You had some indication of non-compliance. He definitely didn't open the door or decide to come out as it went on. Uh, the officer that is involved in this is watching the scene and the suspect comes up with a threatening type maneuver and uh, comes up. The officer believes that the, the suspect has a gun and immediately opens fire. There were uh, several rounds fired on scene by just one officer. Uh, the suspect then went down in the car. The officers moved up fairly quickly. Uh, requested an ambulance code 10 medical profession were able to respond in and uh, the the party was pronounced at the scene there our investigation then started we began talking to witnesses civilian witnesses police officer witnesses and the involved officer detectives worked late into last night on this particular case and uh, you know began a search a search of the vehicle like I said late last night we uh, were not able to recover any firearms in the vehicle uh, we then have the autopsy that is occurring today and we're able to you know complete the search on the suspect over there at this point we have not recovered a handgun related to that so like I said based on the information that we have we know that there are additional potential witnesses out there. I would ask if anybody in the community has uh, observed this or has information about it to please reach out to the Denver Police Department and uh, make themselves available to us. So I think uh, go ahead and open it up for questions at this point. Just to be clear, um, has it been determined that this was the car that you were looking for and person who was in the car was the suspect. Okay, the car from the Crime Stoppers Bulletin is not the car that was used in the vehicle. Uh, the, the vehicle that the suspect was in yesterday or the party that was wanted for aggravated robbery with a handgun was his own vehicle. So, okay. It is the same party, yes. So, okay, yes sir made mention about the, the smoke windows or the darkened windows and uh, kind of a threatening maneuver or, or motion, if you will. Can you expound on that at all? I, I don't want to go into a lot. I mean, bottom line you had, it was very limited as to how much could be seen based on the windows. Uh, the officer that discharged his weapon was probably one of the only parties that had a clear and visible view into that vehicle. Uh, we're going to continue our investigation and do some more towards that. I don't want to get into it, but uh, really the, the really only good unobstructed view into that vehicle was from the front windshield area. Is that where that officer was standing? He was standing behind cover of his vehicle, but he was the only one that was positioned in a point. So he and uh, there was one other officer that, you know, could indicate they could see some of the suspect's actions. Can you say anything about how many commands were given to the suspect? I know numerous commands were given based on you know evidence that we have, witnesses that we've talked to. There was well over or up to approximately one minute worth of commands that were given. They were immediately began based on you know information we have from civilian witnesses to the police officer witnesses. So the actual number of commands I can't answer that. What were the commands? Commands were you know show your hands, you know you're under arrest. We need you to step out of the vehicle. Those type you know, commands to try to take this and resolve it in a peaceful manner. And he didn't follow any of them? None of the commands were followed the, of anybody that I was there. Like I said, there was some indication from, you know, one of the officers that there was, you know, some non-compliant gestures being made. Okay. Any other questions? Questions about oh. the bank robbery? I'm sorry. Oh. Oh, um, I just wondered, so you haven't been able to find the can you explain a little bit more about why uh, the officer thought he was armed and uh, I think going into it and I guess that's part of what I missed uh, this was a very violent bank robbery that went on and this is information that was provided to all of the officers on this 
Uh, our suspect also had a fairly lengthy criminal history uh, to include assault, interference, extortion, uh, shoplifting, dangerous drugs, weapons violations, uh, a fairly long record that went with that. He's also done, you know, s some prison time based on all that. Uh, you know, so the information that they were acting on because of the crime that he was involved in originally, he had a weapon, his past history of having weapons, they believe that to happen. Uh, so the officer, you know, as he came up in a movement, uh, he believed that he had a gun in his hand and he took action based on that belief. But again, you haven't found, you didn't find one in the car or on this person? No. Okay. Why did, uh, why was the arrest made at lunch hour very crowded urban no, area. I guess that's some of the questions that we're gonna to ask this is a very dangerous individual uh, that we do believe we needed to take into custody sooner than later but as we move forward with this case you know if it, when it moves on to like any any internal investigation those will be questions that we, we, we will be looking at asking and hopefully coming to the answer. Right now, I'm working very hard at doing the criminal investigation side of this. Do you look at whether the officer, do you have to wait to look at whether the officer followed all department policy after the criminal investigation is over with? Some of that stuff we're gonna gather, some of that will be gathered in my investigation. They will use my investigation to move forward with any internal. Uh, as with any officer discharge of a weapon, whether a party's hit or not, the investigation is originally starts off with what I do in the criminal aspect of the investigation. That entire investigation uh, is overseen by the independent monitor as it's going on. And then the district attorney's office is intimately involved as with our partners from the Aurora Police Department that came in and assisted us. Uh, that will then be presented to the district attorney where they will make a determination going forth with that. After that determination is made, our complete investigation will be turned over to the Internal Affairs Division and a presentation to a use of force board will then look into whether this was in policy, out of policy, and move forward on that. Uh, Commander, can you say how many shots were fired yet and, and, and how many officers were there at that time? <coughs> uh, Normally, we don't go into the number of shots that are fired. I will tell you news media accounts yesterday and witnesses at the scene. Uh, I would say we have cooperated with they're talking approximately seven, seven shots were fired. Normally, I don't go into that, but uh, I don't want to miss, you know, the obvious is already out there. You have people that were making those statements yesterday, so I'll kind of confirm that. And what was your second question? Uh, how many officers were at the scene at that time? Uh, we had a lot of officers at the scene. Uh, we had at least six, six plus Metro officers that were immediately there. Uh, there was a lot of the surveillance and everything else. Uh, bottom line, we interviewed or took written statements from approximately 30 witnesses. A lot of those were officers at the time. Uh, like I said, I believe based on evidence that we have at the scene that there is potentially some more witnesses out there. I would really encourage them to come forward and talk to us. Yeah. Quick question. So there are surveillance cameras on the environmental health building. I don't know if the, the <coughs> art museum has any, but there's also, it looks like a halo camera at that intersection. Will that help you guys piece together? We're, absolutely. We're going to be pulling and looking at all the video that is resolved. Some of the information that I have, you know, is from some of that. It, I wouldn't call it high quality surveillance video that is going to show much, but you know, it, it does show some. So that is part of an investigation. We always are going to look at any and all aspects of that. Do we have an ID on this guy? We have a tentative ID. I just, that's one of the reasons I was late coming in here. I was on the phone with the coroner's office. They're in the final process of putting something out, uh, talking to the individual that does that over there. He truly anticipates to have it out within the hour. I was hoping that we could come in here, but to follow what our protocol is, they're the ones that release that. Uh, like I said, we do have family members that were at the scene. I know the family has been notified on this, but they're working on doing their final steps that they need to outright confirm what's going on. Uh, so at this time, hopefully within the hour, you will have that information. Was the woman his wife? I, 
I had wife, girlfriend. Uh, I think you kind of depends on who you, which person in the family member. But yes, she was related to or had a relationship with him. And that was his child. I'm not sure that the child was his, but known to him very well. So. Once the coroner does release the identity, um, will you be able to, re because he's got a, a previous criminal past here in Denver, uh, be able to release a, a booking photo? Uh, yeah, the booking photo I will be, I don't have any investigative need at this time to withhold any of that. So that will be released upon them verification. I think the big thing is just verification through fingerprints and uh, cleaning up. Part of the, the thing that I see is we have lots of aliases and lots of uh, date of births by this guy and they, you know, what the coroner's office expressed to me that they want to be accurate in what they put out. And I know there are members of the public that are, that are wondering this question too and I know it's early or too early to ask but that video that we were talking about earlier, surveillance video, will it be made public? If so, what kind of time frame? Generally, that's going to come at the completion of our investigation at this point. Uh, like I said, it's not the greatest of video, but it's video that helps set a time frame. It helps, you know, corroborate statements that were made by witnesses, by officers. Uh, I will tell you it's not good enough that you're going to see actions or, or some of that. It's it's more kind of gross movement of what vehicles did and you can see people walking and, and coming. But that will all be made available upon, you know, the completion of what the district attorney uh, when they come down to it. And, uh, you know, I don't we don't want to jeopardize any type of actions that, that may happen before. Was the car that was that's on the, uh, the alert handed out earlier was that car stolen you said that wasn't his vehicle i don't know that i have that information that information i know they had the jetta with that was there i have not heard anything related i didn't go i guess i can't accurately answer that i do know that it was involved in that crime what involvement it is with him whether it was stolen or, or something else i don't have that did you guys want the officer yeah but okay so the other one we're going to go ahead uh, and announce the, the officer that's involved in this is uh, Officer Jeff Motts. He's a 93 badge number veteran with uh, 22.8 years on the job. He is currently assigned to the Metro SWAT unit. Can you spell his name please? It's M-O-T-Z. get that I, I think any other question or I guess that's it okay thank you